So uh, today's session is again very poignant. We had a session this morning talking about the scale of the challenges facing universities at the moment around uh, savings targets, which can be up to a million, a hundred million pounds in some cases, and some ideas around how to specifically um, take efficiencies programs forward. And today then is about, this webinar is about debt recovery and it's gonna be a very important element for universities going forward. So. Um, we have three speakers with us today. We have uh, Roy Dennis, a Senior Category Manager from LUPC, and two colleagues from suppliers that have been awarded on the debt recovery framework. So um, Roy will bring those two individuals into the discussion uh, throughout the session. And then you will see me again uh, at the end to facilitate some, some Q&A. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Roy. All right, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Marion. And hopefully, there we go, the screen did move on. Yeah, I, I'm, as Marion said, my name is Roy Dennis. I'm the Senior Category Manager um, for Professional Services at LUPC. Um, got two of our suppliers today that are going to give you two great presentations um, with regards to debt recovery. Um, but first of all, I'd like to give you a, a high overview of the debt recovery framework that are available to um, all the members. Um, the framework uh, was originally started in October 2018. Um, it has a three-year uh, term, but it's got a one-year option to extend that term. So if the framework is successful um, and all the suppliers are working well for us, we'll add the uh, extend the agreement by a further year. Um, as usual, it's available to uh, six of the consortia, um, all listed above. I won't go through those individually. Um, it's a, an OGU compliant um, framework. Um, it offers you competitive rates uh, and a quicker route to obtain those services from um, the suppliers. Excuse me. Um, the debt recovery, um, quite often when I'm talking to people about the framework, um, is often referenced in terms of student debt recovery. Um, but the, the framework is designed for both student um, debt recovery and commercial debt. Um, in fact, the activity um, that you'll see under the agreement is around about 70% commercial debt and 30% uh, student um, recoveries, uh, and they're handled slightly differently. Um, it does uh, uh, mainly cover debt for um, under the England and Wales jurisdiction, but it does cover international debt as well. Um, obviously, there's difficulties or more complications in, in recovering international debt, but it's all covered within the framework. In terms of the lot structure for the, for the framework, there are two lots available um, in this uh, version of the framework. Lot one is for pre-legal only collections, and lot two is a, um, uh, a one-stop shop to include those, um, those that wish to pursue possibly through the courts for the, the debt recovery. Um, pre-legal only collections um, was kind of designed in a way that it was more student um, suitable uh, for those uh, institutes that didn't uh, want to uh, be seen as actually chasing from uh, a legal perspective and, and threatening with a legal action. Um, the lots can be used um, as a one-stop shop um, just through lot two or you can actually um, let against or call off against both lot one and lot two if you wish so you can split your your debt recovery um, as you wish all of the suppliers on the framework are um, regulated uh, by either the SRA or the FCA um, that's the um, uh, solicitors regulatory authority or the final financial conduct authority and that allows them to um, provide debt recovery services for both the regulated um, debt and non-regulated debt regulated debt being um, something where there is a, uh, a loan agreement between two parties non-regulated debt more in line with your commercial debt or where there isn't uh, a loan involved and there are five suppliers to each lot, so 10 suppliers in total, giving a, a, a wider selection of suppliers available um, compared to previous, um, 
previous frameworks. So I won't run through every um, supplier that's listed on here, but I'm, I'm sure that some of you will recognize some of the names and already be using some of these companies. Um, the two top names there, Oriel Collections uh, uh, and the Harrison Clark Rickabies are the highest ranked within the framework. And those are the two companies that will be presenting to you after this presentation. Okay, so if you want some more information with regards to the framework, it's as usual, it's available on HE Contracts. This presentation will be available to you after um, today. And that link there will take you directly through to the actual um, framework for debt recovery. Um, as always, um, we recommend the buyer's guide as your source for information. It'll give you far more information than I can deliver to you in a 10 minute slot today. Um, it's a great guide and tells you everything you'll need to know about um, how to call off from um, the framework and the benefits of the framework. Um, within HE contracts, there is the framework terms and conditions and uh, embedded within that the call off terms and conditions so that you'll be able to see the terms of the agreement and use a, uh, a templated version of a call off terms and conditions but it also gives you the option to use your own institutes um, terms and conditions if you so wish there are three other files um, within the same area which are desktop calculator mini competition pricing calculator and supplier supplier pricing um, these are all there for you so that it make it as easy as possible to call off um, and I'll take you through um, the different methods of call off on my next slide. Okay, it's a very simplistic um, guide. Um, there is, uh, whether your debt is over or under 120 days, um, it's always kind of the preferred route to get best value through a mini competition. Um, every institute's debt is going to be um, bespoke to your institute and therefore, um, it's better to actually enter into a mini competition so that you'll get pricing um, and a service that is built around your requirements. Um, for under 120 days debt, there is a desktop exercise option. Um, this allows you to um, look at the original criteria that was set um, in terms of uh, awarding the framework. Um, and you can adjust the weightings on that by 20 percentage points in either direction. Um, the actual framework itself had a weighting originally of 20% towards pricing and commercial terms and 80% towards quality criteria. So um, the, the price on this was not as dominant as perhaps uh, most of our other frameworks. Um, but that's mainly because it's better to uh, to be able to get a successful debt recovery um, rather than uh, be price driven. Um, but it allows you to change those um, that weightings through a desktop exercise and then select the supplier without any further competition. However, this will use the pricing that was originally used in 2018 um, that was based on a, a fictitious scenario of debt. Um, and may look nothing like your organization's debt. For over 120 days, still recommend the mini competition, um, but you do have the option there of using the same desktop exercise, um, but use revised pricing. So use the template forms that we've got there to, to design um, your requirements, show you your debt profile, um, and then use the responses purely on the, the pricing side and feed that back into the desktop calculator and then select the, the best um, uh, supplier um, based on the pricing provided. In terms of pricing for debt recovery, um, sort of three main, main areas that will influence um, the debt recovery and the pricing of it is the age of the debt. You know, the older the debt is, the harder it becomes in order to recover that debt and therefore the, uh, the larger the, the charges will be in terms of recovering. Um, the information on the debtor, the more information that you can provide to the suppliers on uh, the debtor, the more likely that there will be a successful uh, debt recovery. 
and uh, improving that in recovery rate is more important than the rates charged. Um, so in terms of it's better to um, have a, a rate charge at 20% and get a recovery than have somebody with a 10% rate charge but not get a recovery. Yeah. And there are no charges um, if the recovery is unsuccessful. A quick do's and don'ts. Oh, sorry, I've double clicked on that. Let me go to the back one. Um, do, um, do make sure that you reevaluate the areas specific to your organization. So um, look at what your priorities are in your organization and make sure that that forms a part of your specification. Um, and as I said on the previous, do provide as much information as possible so that you get accurate pricing, uh, competitive pricing, um, and increase the opportunities to, to make the recovery happen. Don't reevaluate all of the criteria. Um, but so all of the criteria that was originally put through in there, do not, do not revisit that. Do not use fictitious data in the debt scenario. Make sure that you use your debt profile um, just to increase accuracy. And finally, do not create a framework within a framework. Uh, so if you do opt for lot two and you do go through a mini competition, you can't then award to the two top best um, suppliers. You have to award to the supplier that has given you the best options. Okay. And that comes to the end of uh, my, my slides. Um, we're now going to, uh, sorry, if, if you have any um, questions with regards to the framework, obviously there's the Q&A, um, but if you do need to look at this more in depth, uh, my contact details are within the slide pack, do reach out to me and contact me. Um, I'll now pass you through to Dan Godfrey, who is uh, the Lot 2 supplier, uh, Harrison Clark Rickersby's, an organisation that's been, uh, it's got its history going back as far as 1796. So over to you, Dan. Thanks very much, Roy, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a short presentation on the very subtle differences between student and corporate debt recovery. Um, as Roy said, my name's Dan Godfrey and I'm the head of debt recovery at Harrison Clark Rickabees. I'm um, going to cover a few areas in this webinar. To be honest, each of these could be a webinar in themselves, so I'm going to just focus on the, the main points and just try and give quite a high level overview of, of each stage. So we're going to look at the pre-action protocols, um, which ones apply to which form of debtor, um, some tips on best practice, the time scales to obtaining a county court judgment, both in respect of um, student debt and corporate debt, international claims and the current position in relation to Brexit and the effect that might have in the future. And finally, we're going to look at some temporary legislation that's been put in place as a result of the COVID pandemic, which is affecting the legal process. So first off, pre-action protocols. The pre-action protocol for debt claims, which we refer to as the debt protocol, this applies to individual debtors. So this is going to be predominantly used when we're chasing student debt, but it also applies to sole traders and traditional partnerships. So in order to comply with this protocol, when you are sending a letter of claim, you need to provide the debtor with details of how the debt arose together with supporting documentation so this will include things like terms and conditions outstanding invoices statements of account and any relevant correspondence that you've had with the debtor discussing the outstanding debt from start to finish you also need to confirm how the debt is calculated including any cost and interest so you need to show where your right to interest has arisen whether that's through statute or whether it's through your the practice direction on pre-action conduct, this applies to the vast majority of claims um, that any, any person would bring for a money claim. Um, it's mostly going to apply to corporate debtors in this scenario because um, it cannot apply to individuals, but it doesn't apply to sole traders and traditional partnerships as mentioned in the previous slide. The steps required to comply with this protocol are very similar to those with individuals. Um, but less restrictive. So you still need to provide details of how the debt arose and the supporting documentation. You also need to provide confirmation of how the debt is calculated and any cost and interest and how to pay. 
the main difference is that you only need to give a 14 day period for the debtor to respond and you are less restricted if the debtor decides to respond and raise a query if that query is entirely without merit you can proceed with issuing a claim without risk of being criticized by the court either in costs or on, on a conduct basis okay so next now we're going to look at best practice and just a few tips um, information gathering obviously you don't enter into a contract with the intention of suing all your customers however it's always best to try and obtain as much information as possible at the outset to protect you in that scenario so if you can take can collect detailed contact information so telephone numbers email addresses postal addresses and any alternative addresses and phone numbers they may use um, it's also worth obtaining employment details in respect of individuals and if you can get away with it bank details obviously you have to bear in mind gdpr compliance and you're only entitled to retain the information that's necessary but as long as you can show you have a legitimate reason for holding that information you should be okay um, turning to communication you always need to assess the debtor's attitude when you start discussing outstanding debts because that's going to give you an indication of how best to approach it and how best to make a recovery. So if for any reason you have a debtor that comes across as aggressive, you know you may need to take a, a fairly firm approach um, and also it will give you an indication where you need to take a softer approach with somebody who's maybe struggling either with mental health or just struggling with debt generally. And it's all about knowing the debtor and understanding the best approach to take depending on their tone um, feeds into keeping lines of communication open because again you're not going to get paid unless you're able to talk to the debtor or, or get contact with them and that sort of fits with assessing how they approach the debt because you decide whether you approach it softly or, or in, a, in a slightly more aggressive manner and then finally just a couple of general points uh, act fast always act fast in respect of debt because it may be that the debtor, particularly in respect of corporates, is coming into a period of financial difficulty and you want to be the f at the front of the queue. And also fresh debt is much easier to collect and that applies to both students and corporates. Um, and there, don't be afraid to take court, court action, but always be mindful of the effect on public relations. You always have a legal right to bring a claim, um, but you do need to bear in mind, particularly in relation to students, there may be some issues with the student going to the press or maybe you being criticized in a public forum for actually pursuing them down the court route so it's best to have as much evidence as possible to show that you took as as much as many steps as possible before issuing a claim as a last resort so time scales in terms of individuals these are largely defined by the pre-action protocols i mentioned before so we'll just run through this fairly swiftly um, so the letter of claim you have to give 30 days to respond if they respond more time or information may be required as i discussed if you have to provide further information you are required by the protocol to give them an additional 30 days if there's no response you can issue a claim on day 31 which we'd look to do through the online portal the court will then process that within 48 hours and the claim will be deemed served five days after it's issued the debtor then has 14 days from the end of that five day period to respond to the claim. If they fail to respond, you're entitled to enter judgment in default. If they do respond, the time scales and what you're entitled to do will depend on what the response is. So there may be an admission which entitles you to enter judgment based on the instalment arrangement that they've offered. If they file acknowledgement of service, they get an additional 14 days to respond. And if they file a defense, you then embark on defending court proceedings potentially all the way to trial if uh, if it needs it in terms of corporate debt it's very similar to individuals except with the reduced time scales so 14 day deadline to respond you don't have to be qu quite as strict with giving them further time if they raise a spurious dispute that you don't agree with um, but again if there's no response you can issue the day after and then the process is exactly the same it'll be processed by the court served and then they have the same time period to respond so moving on to the international claims this one could certainly be a webinar in its own right um, 
the current state of play for claims against debtors in the EU. For uncontested claims, you can use the European Order for Payment procedure. Now, this involves sending in an application to court, which the court will then assess. And if they agree that there's a valid claim, they will return it to you for service on the debtor. You can then arrange service through the foreign process section of the High Court and the debtor gets a period of 30 days to respond. If a response is not received within 30 days, you can request a, a European order for payment, which is the equivalent of a county court judgment. If they do respond, the matter will be transferred by the court onto the standard court process as it would with any other money claim. Um, with any other money claims, you issue them at court. If you think there's gonna be a dispute, you just issue them through, oh, moved on one sorry um you'd issue them in the usual way albeit that you need to make sure that the documents are translated into the home language of where the debtor resides if you fail to provide the translation the debtor is entitled to refuse service of the claim and that claim effectively falls away so you would then have to start the process again um, once those claims have been issued, again, you arrange for service through the foreign process section of the High Court and they arrange service on debtors under the Recast Brussels regulation using an authorised agency in the debtor's home jurisdiction to serve the claim. And that The Recast Brussels regulation provides for cross-border agreements in relation to service and enforcement of judgments. Now, if you obtain a, a judgment that you need to enforce in, in an EU jurisdiction, we can engage solicitors in those jurisdictions who will register the judgment and then we'll take whatever steps necessary to try and recover the debt. And in terms of the rest of the world, you will need a law and jurisdiction clause that confers jurisdiction on England and Wales to be able to bring a claim in this country. If, if you don't have that jurisdiction clause, the debtor can defend the claim um, can contest jurisdiction on the claim and it's it's quite a straightforward method to get the claim struck out so you need to make sure you've got that provision in place if you don't have that provision in place you can engage solicitors in the debtor's home country to bring the claim under the correct jurisdiction so all is not lost it just makes it a bit more difficult and again it's arranged service of the, the claim will be arranged through the foreign process section of the high court okay so brexit as things stand, when the transition period uh, transition period ends at the end of the year, the process that applies to the rest of the world now will apply to debtors in the EU. However, the UK government has submitted an application to accede to the Lugano Convention, which will effectively give the same provisions as it has now under the Brussels regulation, albeit it's not quite as strict in terms of the exclusive jurisdiction clause. So the debtor could potentially issue um, counter proceedings in its home jurisdiction um, to try and defeat your claim in England and Wales. Um, at the moment, all the other countries apart from the EU have confirmed they'd be happy for the, the U UK to join the Lugano Convention um, and we're just waiting for the EU to confirm its position and to whether that's going to apply. Okay, so finally, we're going to look at some temporary legislation that's arisen from the COVID pandemic. The taking control of goods and certification of enforcement. This effectively bars high court enforcement agents from making home visits during the pandemic. So it's currently in place in relation to social distancing. It's stopping people from attending other people's homes and, and potentially causing a spread of the disease. They are still enforcing by email and phone. Um, Obviously, it's not quite as effective as, as the bailiffs knocking on the door. Um, Civil Procedural Practice Direction 51Z. This applies to stay any possession proceedings that are issued by landlords or charge holders for a period of 90 days. Um, since I prepared these slides, that's actually been extended to the 30th of October. Um, so we'll have to wait and see whether it gets extended again. Um, Civil Procedural Practice Direction 51Y. Um, remote hearings, the courts have had to adapt in relation to the COVID pandemic. So a number of court hearings are now taking place by phone and by video. They've had to do a very careful balancing act in relation to ensuring the hearings go ahead, but also while giving the public, public access to the hearings as they would be entitled to in, in the normal court 
multiple courtrooms, such as, for example, a public gallery and criminal proceedings. Um, and then finally, limitations on presenting winding up petitions. This is a bill currently going through Parliament called the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Um, it hasn't passed yet, um, but the court has already made a determination um, preventing the presentation of a winding up petition on the assumption that that legislation is going to go through because it's going to have retrospective effect and it's going to apply from the 27th of April to a period one month after the legislation passes. So for the time being, if you're going after a corporate debtor, we can't present a winding up petition unless we can show that the company was not financially affected by COVID. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, obviously, there's an option to put questions in the Q&A, um, but my contact details are on screen should anyone wish to make contact to discuss any of the, the points raised. Um, and I'm now going to hand you over to Chris Vickery from Oriel Collections. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Vickery, Director at Oriel. Uh, thanks for attending today, and I hope I can shed a little light on the thorny issue of debt recovery and the future challenges. So um, I'm gonna skip through this as quickly as I can, but as informatively as I can. Um, I'm gonna paint the current picture first for us to have a look at. I'm not able to move my screen forward at the moment. That's better. I'm now gonna just go back one. We've known for a long time that financial worries are a prime driver in deteriorating uh, mental health amongst HE students, which of course, uh, who are carrying the heaviest burden. And we know from numerous studies that this manifests itself in higher levels of substance abuse. Now, if we build into this likely rising debt levels that some students are going to experience for reasons that I will touch on in a moment, we also know that students with long-term or past debt problems are much more likely to present mental health issues as well. Now, I will say at this point that the research for this presentation was carried out by my son's girlfriend, who is, um, sorry a second, I'll just go back there. Uh, my son's girlfriend, she, uh, who is an overseas student from Brazil and studying for a master's in, uh, in neuroscience at a London university and currently writing about catastrophizing. So for several reasons, uh, she's obviously a pretty good sounding board. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one now. Um, so if we develop this a little further, in 2013, we knew that the relationship between finances and mental health uh, can be tied down to the worry about debt and its impact on the individual more than the actual debt itself, and that worry about debt is an accurate predictor of anxiety, depression, and stress. Now, we also know that universities are in crisis. I know you've been speaking a lot about saving, uh, cost savings this morning uh, because of student numbers, falling student numbers, because of uh, the increasing perception, many reasons, of course, but it's uh, maybe it's not affordable, perhaps growing concerns, particularly amongst uh, overseas students, that part-time employment might be difficult to, to find, and growing anxiety over job prospects, even uh, with a degree. Now, what this means is that we'll be dealing with a more anxious group of young people who may increasingly fall into debt and be less able to climb out of it. So the consequences of this um, unfortunate cocktail of difficulty are numerous, but here's two that I've put at the bottom there. Um, your finance team are gonna need to show even more latitude over spreading payments than ever, and this will put more pressure on a worsening financial situation. And that if you don't, you may increasingly find yourself being compared unfavorably with your competitors via the uh, student and media grapevine. In other words, bad news will travel faster and more of that in a moment. I've got a, a, a quick forecast here. We had some employment figures out for Q1 this morning for those of you listening to the news. Um, it shows likely unemployment amongst students at the end of this quarter um, which is almost, and in 12 months time, which in fact is almost exactly double uh, of the forecast for the population at large. Now, if this becomes the reality, it will of course place an enormous burden on student finances, and of course being in debt whilst they're studying much more likely. 
So uh, we have uh, a situation where we know debt anxiety is a significant and rising factor. And we also uh, can safely predict that young people away from home may experience greater anxiety caused by other factors like a return of the virus, for example, the impact on their private and social life. Now, having debt on top of this is a pretty challenging landscape for you to deal with. We've already touched on the certainty that we're all going to have to need to offer greater flexibility over payments, and this will present several challenges. In other words, how do you keep students on track without uh, to pay without pressurising them? Now, at Oriel, we're a fair bit ahead here because we collect debt in a lot of challenging markets like tax and the NHS, as well as the education space. So our agents are trained to spot vulnerability and real financial hardship in conversations before leading the customer down the most beneficial pathway. But this group is growing so quickly and likely to grow even faster amongst young people, of course, who by definition have all have some vulnerability. So you'll almost certainly need to introduce or increase your team of professionally trained counsellors within finance who may need to discuss several issues at once, not just the debt issue. I'll return to this theme in a moment or two, but the point here is that your team must have the ability to spot genuine vulnerability, and this sometimes takes some pretty shrewd questioning techniques to ensure that the person concerned isn't going to get the next letter or other communication that will just make things worse. Now, through commercial necessity, we're actually separating this group, vulnerability uh, group, from our standard activity because, unfortunately, the industry is still almost entirely paid on what is collected. Uh, despite spending on average three times longer on the phone dealing with some of society's most vulnerable people. So the next issue is uh, communications. Um, people get very confused about what's causing the stress and they think, oh dear, this person, you know, they have got debt trouble, uh, we better not bother them. Now this is wrong. The debt itself is the issue, not being contacted about it. But, but here's the rub. Is the contact the right type of contact or not? Um, so, you know, what is the right way? Um, well, we need to consider three issues. The first one is men um, of contact. The second is flexibility of contact. And the third is the actual content itself. Now, let's look at the first method. So if you're still dependent on uh, the letter as the main source of communication, you must accept that you're dealing with a bunch of people who will look at the letter as pretty archaic, I might not even trust its contents. And if you don't believe me, go to student halls or accommodation and look at how much uh, of a pile of unopened mail you often find. If you're still over dependent on the phone, you must accept that you're dealing with people for whom a conversation is often an anathema. Now we run campaigns of up to a thousand numbers per hour being dialed. And with that, that scale of dialing, we would consider 3% part, uh, right party contacts, talking to the right person are pretty good results. So, as part of the mix, yes, a good idea. As the main tool of contact, you know, forget it. You need, you, you must have other things in the mix, like, for example, email campaigns, and you need to know the best times to send them because the response rates vary enormously depending on the time that you're actually sending them. You should have text messaging set up. You, you need perhaps a WhatsApp to run WhatsApp uh, messaging campaigns. You might need to look at secure web chat. That's another option. You need a mix of communication channels that give the student the choice to communicate with you in the channel that they choose. And then you need the flexibility to stay with them in that channel. Um, so what about content? Now, this is really where the problems start. You'll see the words self-serve tools a must. Um, have you thought about students, before we go on to content, about setting, uh, students setting up their own payment plans online as an example? because you, know, you now you probably need to look at something like that, um, a bit of innovation. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this up fairly quickly now. The title in this slide is the giveaway. Uh, I'm emphasizing engagement is paramount. The right type of engagement is also key. Every message you send, you must empathize with your students, predicament, you must invest time in multi-channel communications, and you must make sure you can properly use them, which of course, it takes time. Uh, you should never make vague threats, and frankly, you should be thinking very carefully about making any threats at all in the current climate. Um, the presentation, uh, I know that the presentations today are available on 
on the LUP's website afterwards. So I'd urge you to check out the link at the bottom there because it's a film that we made and showed at the launch event in April 2019 and it does show a good student debt journey using text messaging. Uh, the bubble on the right hand side is a standard piece that we're using in all our communications and I think it is a good example of how uh, to show empathy to get people to encourage them to contact you not just to threaten them. Now I want to end on a positive note. Uh, Rise of Home Working, uh, we found that the uh, uh, it works. All our agents uh, have been working at home at some point. We've learned how to do it compliantly because we can see and hear everything. We're now actively looking at uh, perhaps recruiting a different type of counselling agent, maybe older, a little wiser, who wants to work flexibly at home and will deal exclusively with our vulnerable customers, leaving our call centre staff to work with the more standard stuff. I'm sure like you, uh, that this is the, um, our, um, my millionth Zoom call since we had lockdown, uh, but this could also work extremely well uh, as a face-to-face -face contact, albeit once removed, uh, to talk to students and empathise and, and, and talk about their debt difficulty. Uh, so it's a minefield, this area. Obviously, uh, you know, if you want to talk about outsourcing to process or a better way of managing your student payment plans, of course, you know where we are. So that's ended my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm now going to hand over to Marion for our Q&A session. Yes, and thank you so much, Chris. That was really interesting and a very interesting uh, link to explore, obviously, um, between you know debt collection and mental health and some of the obvious challenges there. Um, so I'll invite Roy and Dan to join us as well for the Q&A session. There's been some interesting ones coming up. Um, so if I kick off, um, one of the questions uh, as sort of a fundamental level is what, what debt is too small to chase? So what should universities be thinking actually might, might be a greater investment than pay off in the end? Um, should I take that? Yeah, yeah go okay. ahead, Chris. Yeah, go uh, the, no debt is too small to chase. Um, there is a cost to each debt. Um, the, the framework, it, it, as we've discussed, is based on uh, a no success, no fee. Um, the actual process of, of, of collecting a debt can be um, quite quite minimal um, if we're using, for example, digital strategies, phone calls and so forth. So, you know, traditionally we chase library debt, we chase some very small value debt. Obviously, I would, uh, look, I would look very hard at the viability of taking a small value debt to, to, to legal action. I'm sure Dan would agree with me. Yeah. Um, but if effectively, you know, we could be looking at debts of 20 to 30 pounds. We would do some minimal chase uh, process on it. But actually, if that's referred to third party, they usually pay. The success rates are very high. So I would actively encourage people to place debt, no matter how small, but within certain parameters. Perfect. Uh, go ahead. Did you have something to add, Dan? Yeah, just, just to sort of add on to what Chris was saying there about referring sort of smaller debts to legal. As, as he says, no, no debt is too small to chase. Um, but obviously it, it becomes a commercial decision for the creditor as to whether they want to incur legal fees, for example, in, in issuing a claim. So the, the smallest court fee you'd pay is, is £35 just to, to issue a claim at court. So if you're looking at the library, library mm -hmm. fees, like Chris was saying, £20 to £30, pounds, you're immediately paying a court fee that's more than the value of the debt. So that would obviously make no sense. Um, obviously going further up the scale in terms of level of debt, the court fees do get higher, but they become more proportionate to the value. So for example, if you issue a claim for 10,000 pounds or just below the court fees, 455 pounds. So mm. it's, it's still, it's still a big number, but proportionately to the size of the debt, it's, it's much smaller. So it makes it more viable. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to just pick up on a question that's sort of related to the process as we're talking about the actual collections. Um, so would you as suppliers track the progress of each debt collection and how do you communicate the progress back to the, the, the owner of that so, debt? So the pre, at the, at the pre-legal stage where, where we're involved, the, um, all, all our clients have a, a full uh, a range of facilities open to them. They have web access uh, they have unlimited access for users, so they can have 10 users at the university that can log on. They can see everything that we're doing. They can see every letter. They can see every phone call. They can see everything we're sending out. Mm -hmm. uh, they, can, they can instruct us. They can ask us to hold. They can ask us to close and so forth. They can query things uh, on the portal as well. And they also can order a whole range of reports. So it's, it's, it's like everything we're doing, we're in the next room. They can see everything that we're doing. And in, indeed, if there's a complaint or a dispute, they can hear every call that we're making because we can send them encrypted phone calls, you know, with a password to open. So it's very transparent, completely up to date, all in real time. They can see everything. Great. 
Thanks. Um, and so again, linked linked question is, what's the sort of success rate in terms of, of debt recovery and collection, would you say? Dan? Uh, I, th I think from, from my perspective, the, the rates of success are better the earlier you get the debt. So mm -hmm. it comes back to what I was saying about acting fast. The sooner you, the sooner you realize there's potentially going to be a problem or it's outside your payment terms, and to act and to start the process because that's going to give you your best chance of getting paid. The longer you leave it, the less chance you, you, will, you will recover. Um, not sure I could probably put a number on it because mm. every type of debt is different. So again, sort of going back to what Chris was saying about library fees and the smaller amounts, you, you might see a very high success rate there. But when you're pursuing, say, a student for a, a whole year's fees, that may not be... A, a quick success mm. even if you do ultimately end up recovering everything at all it's, it's actually quite uh, it's quite um frustrating to see that tenders are still coming out in the education space right left and center uh where people are asking about pricing and, and putting about 50 percent uh tariff you know um loading on the pricing mm -hmm. nobody seems to ever think about the age of the debt i mean we've already roy mentioned you know there are two a uh, lot there are two pieces to look at here uh, one is less than 120 day debt, which is much, much more collectible the, the quicker you get it. And all our university and college clients, that's all we really ever get across them. We keep getting across. We know your resources are stretched, but your recoveries are gonna go sky high if you can get the debt to us in a timely way. Right. Once it starts getting older, the other of course, the major driver is the quality of the information they're getting us. If they give us a debt that's 40 days old, but there's no phone number, there's no email, there's nothing you know, then, then success rates are less. <laughs> yeah. So it's quality, data, and age. They're the, they're the drivers. Absolutely. And it brings up an interesting question that was posed in the chat about maybe the, the ethics of pursuing debt in the current climate. Um, so, you know, what supplier support might be available? I know you sort of touched on this to debtors, you know, given that we're in the middle of COVID-19 and, and some people have been forced to stay, you know, at, at university campus where they, they may have gone home otherwise, if you have anything to, to say about that. Yeah. I think it's it's all going to come down to being sort of show, showing empathy to debtors and, and understanding what their situation is. Just just because of the, the pandemic, it doesn't prevent us going out and trying to collect debts that are outstanding, but it mm. just means that we have to have a different focus. So we need to bear in mind potential mental health issues, probably more so than we ordinarily would, but mm -hmm. also situations where people maybe haven't been working whether they've been furloughed or whether they've just been made redundant whether they are as you say students living in student accommodation because they haven't been able to go home so it, it's all about mm. just sort of knowing the debtor scenario and just trying to keep lines of communication open but also being empathetic and also having a bit of flexibility in relation to installment arrangements because it's it's better to get little bits now with the option to increase later mm -hmm. than saying we must have full payment now and it, and it really is, um, it, it, it really is even more about encouraging contact, but it becomes almost a journey of negotiation and understanding and listening. You know, all those skills are, are needed because, you know, sometimes as I refer to in my presentation quickly, you do really have to ask quite a few pointed questions to get to the, the bottom of really what's, what's the problem. It could be mm. quite serious problems that the present, you know, they want to pay, but there's lots of lots of other issues that are preventing them, you know, loss of income, loss of a part time job, you know, mental health issues. And you've really got you're not going to get anywhere until you actually get to the bottom, bottom out what the real issues are and get mm. them to trust you. And then once they trust you, you know, you can move forward. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm aware we're, we're slightly over in time. So I have one more question I'd like to pose to you both. And then any questions we don't get to, we'll take away as a group and, and can get back to members. Um, but our last one is, if we successfully use debt collection companies um, and manage to recover a high percentage of debt, could we do without our own credit control departments, do you think, universities? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have to say that in this, in this day and age, were we talking about um, the difficulty of the, 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 the very powerful media and the, and the ease of which you can get adverse per plus publicity, falling student numbers, students with much more likely to, to have mental health issues. This is becoming a specialist area. And, you know, I think there's a very compelling discussion now about how uh, not only maybe outsourcing should be more of the way to go, but also uh, branding services where, you know, a, a specialist can do it 
in the university's name, which is all quite possible and is being done now, mm. you know, in, in, in college groups and uni universities across the UK. But this is becoming a bit of a minefield. And um, at every stage, if you introduce a new communication channel, you've got to look at the, the consent, you've got to look at getting people secure, validating, verifying who they are. Mm. You know, it is a potential minefield, but you've got to deal with the fact that students don't want to communicate in the old ways anymore. Mm. Very true, very true. And I think spot on with, with the um, discussion thread there, uh, Chris, around the appropriateness of communications and the, the sentiment behind them. And, you know, I think everyone recognizes this is a time and it's a sensitive subject to be, to be pursuing with folks. Sure. Um, so with that, I, I, we've got some other good questions in there, but what, what we can do is take these away and think about producing something for members that addresses some of these additional ones, if we're all happy with that. Excellent. So it just really leaves me then to thank, um, thank you, Roy, Dan and Chris. That was a really interesting session, something that's very relevant and timely for members. So again, for our attendees, we will post the um, session slides and a recording of today's webinar and look at producing something off the back of this that answers any additional questions you might have. Um, we'll be doing another webinar hopefully in July for LUPC and SUPC members. So please keep uh, your eyes peeled for more information on that. But thank you all again.